Cedo, as Colette called her mother, loathed sacrificing flowers to the dead. She, who was the most generous of women, would refuse a request for them to adorn a hearse or a grave. She bristled at the very idea, knitted her brow. What? My moss roses on a corpse? Horrid. Unthinkable. Three quarters of a century later, on August 8, 1954, her daughter, Gabrielle Sidonie Colette, or simply Colette, as the world then knew her, was buried amid a very luxuriance of flowers with pomp and circumstance. The only woman in France ever to receive a state funeral. Nevertheless, Colette herself had written, death doesn't interest me. No, not even my own. She had been born in a small village in Burgundy and died at the age of 81, having written more than 60 volumes and won a place of eminence in the world of letters. Hers was the story of a born watcher. We look, but never closely enough, never long enough, and never with enough passion, never. The term she used was regard, but by that she almost certainly meant also to wonder, feel, experience, to penetrate that no man's land between the senses and emotions. It was her insistent theme, her leitmotif, as far back as her earliest youth. Of those days, she wrote, our garden, bathed in a yellow light, was tremulous with reds and violets. But I couldn't tell if those reds, those violets, acquired their magic from my perception of them at the moment or from some happiness recollected. reverberating in the warm yellow gravel. The sun piercing the weave of my wide-brimmed straw hat. Those long summers that were almost without night. I was never taught any professional trade. I knew how to climb, whistle, run, but no voice borrowed the sound of the wind to whisper in my ear the advice to write and write, and by writing, to dim my thrilling and tranquil perceptions of the living universe. Can anyone understand what it was like to have gone from a small village to the life I was to lead in Paris after my first marriage? Was it not an adventure so extreme as to bring a young girl of 20 to despair, to despair or wild intoxication? As for my wedding, has there ever been one more modest or conventional? Still, there was something strange about it. The bride, dressed in white muslin, looked nice but rather pale, exhausted after having spent the afternoon in her garden exploring an anthill. The poetry of my youth had been of solitude, independence, preoccupation with my family and with nature. But from that day on, everything changed. The man she married was considerably older than herself. His nom de plume was Willie, 
and he employed a corps of ghostwriters. It was at his insistence that she wrote her first novel, Claudine at School, a fictionalized account of her childhood and an instant success. But it was Willie who listed himself as sole author, as he did of her three Claudine sequels. Vaguely, I became aware of a duty toward myself to write about something other than Claudine. The day I was given a little money in exchange for the pages I had written, I realized that I would have to write every single day. Slowly, submissively, patiently. And that behind the voluptuous novel, there would be a sober-minded, stay-at-home writer. Colette was 33 when she was divorced from Willie. One can get used to living alone, but to languish alone in a fever, alone, always alone. Still, I don't pity myself, even as I tremble before the rain lashing my window pane. I have no regrets. How just was the criticism of one of my husbands? But can't you write about anything that isn't about love, adultery, semi-incestuous relations, and an ultimate separation? Yet what I really want to write about are things sad and pure, bucolic landscapes, flowers, sorrow human dignity, and the innocence of animals threatened by man. All her life, Colette attempted to bridge the gulf between men and animals, cats especially. After all, what does one risk by the companionship of cats? but the chance of enriching one's own self. Is it not out of self-interest that I have been seeking their company for half a century? But her sympathies embraced all animals that escaped the domination of man. One can't love animals and men at the same time. With each passing day, I become more suspect to my fellow creatures. But if they were indeed my fellow creatures, would I be suspect to them? Her curiosity led her along many paths. Besides being a novelist and short story writer, she was a sometime actress, mime, dancer, journalist, film scenarist, drama critic, music hall entertainer, and more. Few modes of expression left her indifferent. The theater especially played a prominent role in her life. Several of her works were adapted for stage and screen, the most famous of which being Gigi. The stage was one world in which she could take instant refuge. Another was friendship, that loving friendship which was to her the essence of femininity. It is not out of passion that fidelity between two women is engendered, but out of a feeling of kinship. I say kinship when perhaps the word should be a likeness. This sensuality has no need of consummation, but only the joys of sympathetic glances exchanged, the gentle touch of a hand, the emotion aroused by hair smelling of warm wheat, the comfort of an habitual presence, of pleasures shared. These are what ensure fidelity between them. Why does pride so fasten itself to my heart that it will allow only certain people to reside there? My own daughter, in fact. How I recall my own self-mistrust when I learned of my pregnancy. I was fearful of motherhood, perhaps of an incapacity for love. Colette, who in life and literature played so many parts, was also a witness to her times and her vignettes of her contemporaries, the great and near great, the obscure, the famous and infamous, are memorable. Of Proust, she wrote, I used to meet Marcel Proust at the salon of Madame Armand de Cavalier. We were both young then. Swan's Way, what a triumph that was. The labyrinth of childhood and adolescence revealed, re-examined. Here was everything one would have wanted to write, 
everything one didn't dare to write or knew how to write. Commitment to life never wavered, even when racked by arthritis and confined hopelessly to the bed she called her raft. There are no harvests, she wrote, but in autumn. Perhaps that is also true of love. But nothing obliterates the past. It is I who am adrift. Still, I don't despair. I know that life is an open sea, not a desert, and that is enough to sustain me in my affliction. With humility, I am going to go on writing. For me, there is no other destiny. But when does one stop writing? What warning is there? When the hand begins to tremble? Once I thought that writing was like any other task. You lay down the tool and joyfully exclaim, finished. Then you clap your hands and find, raining down from them, grains of sand you thought precious. It is then that you read in the outlines traced by those grains of sand, the words, to be continued. To be continued. So it was even to the end of her life, even at 80, there remained with her that same unflagging curiosity that had shaped her work from its beginning. Thank you.